the Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee meeting back to order. Please note that the Zoom session is being recorded. And I'll bring the Concord School Committee meeting back to order. So we first have minutes. Well, okay, going to the minutes. Are we, unless we're waiting for Eva? David, any objection? Or I wonder if you want to go to the students. I think we can go ahead. Why don't we just go? She's trying. I think she acknowledged she's, I think she's having some IT issues. Yeah, we can oh, go to the students. There she is. There she is. Good. We have Emma. So why don't we go okay. to the students first and then they can, they can go to another Zoom call. <laughs> That's exactly right. Take on some knowledge. All right. <laughs> so Amy. And Amy and Linda, welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, so, uh, what do you, yeah, anything in particular that you would like to be, like, keep hearing about over how the last <laughs> yeah. few weeks have gone? Because it's a lot. You mean you don't it's have any demos or competitions to update us on? <laughs> Maybe it's true. Give us a sense of how students are reacting to the online learning stuff and some of the challenges and some of the benefits, if there are any. Um, I think for like the last few weeks have actually they've been going okay. Like I think most teachers have been sticking to not too much work per day. You know, only twenty thirty minutes per class we've been getting per day, and it's been like I think it's been a they've been trying to find a good way to move forward in the material without overwhelming us one day, which I think has been going well so far. And I think we labeled this new week where we're actually allowed to move on in the curriculum as phase two. And I think the transition to phase two has been pretty smooth and it's been um, pretty easy to get a sense of like what we can do from here. And I can speak on, um, Amy and I are both juniors, so going into the process of actually applying to colleges, mm -hmm. it's a little tough knowing that um, the June SAT was just mm -hmm. canceled yesterday. So that does probably indicate that the ACT will be canceled. So as for testing and whatnot, it's a little tough, but obviously that has nothing to do with how this, how CCHS is running things. Yeah, it's, just, it's been a little stressful definitely, I think as juniors, like this is like a super big year for us and we're not really sure what it's, how it's going to go to the end of the year. I think that's kind of something people are stressed about, just not really knowing what's gonna happen with the year and like what's gonna happen with grades and stuff like that. So I think that's what people are thinking about. It's also nice to know, um, we had a student senate meeting just last night, and it's nice to know that we are still taking on some projects that we can do from our home, but also involve our community in. Mm -hmm. Wow. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the projects you're taking on as part of the student senate? Uh, well, we have a letter writing campaign where we have not only us, but also several other students in the CCHS community. They have drafted letters that we're planning to send out to the Minuteman ARC and other senior centers. Um, we're trying to do this thank you, our gratitude committee, I guess we haven't really worked out the name, where we can somehow get the thought out there that we are very grateful for those working on the front lines at Emerson and just in other communities around us. And whether it's gonna be you know, drafting more letters or making a huge video or website. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I think so. It's been, I think like since we went into phase two, it's been a little more consistent with the amount of work because at first they were, the teachers were not sure what to do. But I think now that we've gone into phase two, it's gone more consistent and we kind of know how each day is going to go. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think also, um, it's kind of like a trial and error sort of thing where they can try something and see if it works, get some student feedback. And if it doesn't, then they try something new. If it does, then we continue and we roll with it. Um, I think that also goes for like the Zoom calls and like which, what time we can schedule them. So then I know um, administration is currently trying to develop a schedule so that I don't have, you know, my math class overlapping with my history class. And I think as this week has progress we were able to see like what what's going to work best for us with time moving forward 
Yeah, and yeah, I know that there are some people who aren't as motivated to work, I think, though, because the way we're doing it, which I think it's good we're doing it with credit no entry and stuff like that. But I think that's kind of for some people, seem, they take it as like a free pass to just not do the work at all. But that, that's their own choice, I guess. So just a couple follow-up comments there. The schedule, we, we had a draft schedule and we've just found some glitches. So Linda's right, we're reworking that. Mr. Mastrullo's on that. Um, this is a really strong group of student senators. I've met with them a couple of times since the break, the closure, and um, they're full steam ahead, which has just been fun. <laughs> Good. Um, well, that's uh, uh, sounds like positive things in a challenging time. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, keep your eye on those colleges. They're probably going to have to adapt, and I've been reading things about. Mm -hmm. Dispensing with yeah. SATs and ACTs for guidance on admissions. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there'll be some other things they have to do too. Um, we're all in this together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're welcome to hang around and listen or, uh, or take off. We can see you though. So, <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Linda. Um, so next we'll be reading of the minutes. They're all joint meeting. Um, so can I have a, a, uh, a motion to accept the joint meeting minutes of 225-20, 310-20, and 324-20? Um, I, I want to make a couple of notes on them, Wally, if I might. Yeah, can we get a motion first, though? Sure. Uh, so moved. Seconded for both. Okay. Okay, so uh, comments on changes. Uh, <clears throat> just a, a couple of couple of notes if I might, and I'll bring these up in chronological order. Give me a moment here. Uh, two twenty-five. Uh, just want for the record to note that uh, on Item five, let me find it here, forgive me. This is 225? Yes, 225. Um, where uh, it reads, Mr. Booth noted that the uh, Concord Middle School Building uh, Committee will not be sharing out many design concepts at the forum because it would like to receive more community feedback uh, and I want to make it clear that uh, uh, we, we do want uh, a lot of sharing, but we wanted uh, uh, unfettered feedback first. So I would just plug in that word, uh, receive more community feedback first. And then there would be a lot more release of the design firm's ideas. Mm -hmm. but we, so didn't that want, be... we didn't want them... Uh, uh, the think the community thinking limited by those designs. So that would be adding first to after if, feedback. If you see fit, yeah. Uh, turning to March twenty four, uh, uh, where I referenced teachers keeping journals. Uh, I I want to note that that wasn't a singular specific suggestion, but rather it was an advocating the idea that Lori work with her leadership team and with the teachers to see that we're collecting as much data generally about the efficacy of the new online model. That's all. How they do it, I leave to them. So journals was not a, a singular uh, suggestion, but rather uh, by way of an idea, one idea. So just for context, no change in the in the minutes. Okay. Uh, on M March 10, I went back to the video, the questions about who moved for executive session. It was Booth Rainey brought us into uh, the session on their motion and Rainey Booth adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? 
That's it for me. Okay. There, were, there were also question marks on, on the February one in terms of who moved something. That's what I was going to bring up, whether those were filled in yet. Uh, let's take a look. I have to go back and look. I got it up here. Um, uh, motion was made by second to adjourn. Hmm. At the end. Oh, we have to figure that out because we won't be on tape. It was all right to adjourn the executive, adjourn from executive session. No, that's in German of the meeting, I think, isn't it? Right. It was during the meeting, but it was at the end of executive session, so it won't be on. Oh, that's right. We went in after. Yeah. Right. It was, we went in at the end, so it won't be on tape. Uh, we'll have to look back at whoever took minutes for exec. So maybe we can um, approve them with the note that we need to get that from the executive session minutes. Yeah, we can approve these as is, not yep. with the very clear reference to the fact that that is a question mark. Yep. Okay. Okay. So okay. Um, anything else? That was all I had. Okay, let's... Uh... Uh, all in favor of the motion with the amendments made. Okay, sorry, well, it's got to be a roll call. That's mm -hmm. a roll call. That's... Okay, so <laughs> about aye for both. Booth, aye for both. Johnston, aye. Mustafi, aye for region. Modell, aye for region. All right. Motion carries. Superintendent's report. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna hit highlights. I took the time to put it to paper, so it's on attached to the agenda, and I won't read it to you. I'll just uh, reference it as I provide some updates. Uh, as Linda mentioned, we rolled out phase two of the learning opportunities um, on April 6th, and obviously they're starting to see the difference, which is good to hear. Um, the major differences there are student accountability. As they mentioned, we're doing a credit no entry system and tracking kids for participation and actively reaching out to them if they're not engaged. Um, teachers are teaching new content at the middle and high school as appropriate and at a pace that feels doable um, in the remote learning environment. Um, we're doing uh, essentially science and social studies, new instruction in uh, the elementary grades. We're also providing a range of adaptive software that allows kids to progress at their level. So it differentiates and the more successful you are in the software, the farther you're gonna go and begin to get into new content if that fits on the student profile. Uh, we're documenting all of this very thoroughly. Kristen's got a master plan for that so that our curriculum maps will reflect what we provided for new information and what we didn't. And we know that needs to roll forward into the fall um, in terms of our curriculum planning for 2021. Uh, in terms of other parts of the school closure, we are paying our employees um, in terms of what they're doing if they're not actively part of the remote learning, which that does include all of the professional staff and faculty, as well as the tutor uh, population of employees. Transportation and cafeteria are engaged in a number of virtual training sessions. Um, the custodial staff is actually rotating building checks and certainly on call for us at any time. You know, I actually used the template that I always use for the uh, reports to all of you, and I wasn't sure that was going to work, and it actually did. So I'm going to report out in that same framework as the goals and things in our in, in my goal set of goals and the strategic plan. And I thought that actually spoke well that we have goals that can translate to such a very different environment. Uh, student wellness by far is our top concern, and that's why we've created the program the way we have. So our first priority is making sure kids' mental and physical health is intact. Um, we're very closely aligned with challenge success recommendations, which actually happened in reverse order because they just put those out after we were up and running. So that was validating. Um, and we're also staying really close to families in need. You know, these are very challenging times, whether it's be that you're a two, two parent working household with little kids trying to do everything or you're a family where 
you know, jobs have just been cut or actually someone's sick. So trying to be sure we're connected with families and are supporting people. Um, on the later on the agenda is a reference to our memorandum of agreement uh, proposed with the teachers associations to wrap up the evaluation process. Um, I did smile when I got to in innovative pedagogy because I don't think this is what I had in mind <laughs> when I said we would try new things this year, but we are trying all sorts of new things. I think what I love to hear when Amy and Linda were speaking, like we're trying stuff and using this incredible feedback loop with the kids, especially the older kids, to better understand what's working and what needs to be tweaked. But um, the, the staff is creating really engaging, innovative approaches, and then the parents on the other side are the partner to that, and we're just so grateful for all the efforts that have gone in from every direction to make this uh, feel as solid as it does, um, even especially in week five. But right from the get-go, we felt really, really positive. So um, in terms of inclusion and cultural competency, those are very much goals. They're just in a different frame than they were before. We've made, made sure we're giving technology to elementary families that need it. Um, obviously providing food and, and supports to other organizations for families who are in need of just basics. Um, uh, the Boston families have been a primary focus of a number of people, um, including regular trips into the city. And I know uh, that's been everywhere from a just typical kind of support to really crisis level support. So uh, lots of extraordinary work going on there. Um, Ruth Groovy and all the special education staff is, meets regularly um, at the building level and Ruth provides that umbrella of the framework in which we're operating. Obviously we can't replicate IEP services. We are using those IEP goals though as a guide for what we do provide. Teachers are in many cases holding office hours at the secondary level which we ended up after some discussion going to a more of the learning center model we had before all the West Ed reviews had happened. And that's allowing kids to get support in their regular general ed curriculum or if they've got replacement work to get support in that. So that's been a positive. Um, there's regular information going out from related service providers at least weekly that gives uh, parents and kids activities to maintain and um, work on those goals. We are holding some IEP meetings virtually um, and we're awaiting DESE guidance uh, in terms of timelines because right now timelines are frozen. So any meetings we're having is just a mutual agreement of the schools and families. Um, we know we're all anxious to hear what DESE's guidance will be because obviously there's a backlog growing of, um, of meetings that aren't being held. So anxiously awaiting that. Uh, Ruth and I have met with the CPAC leadership and then the executive board over the last couple of weeks and um, she's actively working on a frequently asked question document collaboratively with them that should be going out shortly. And then I just finally the community and collaboration I think this too has been something we're really um, feeling is a priority uh, working with a number of different agencies in both communities. Um, just the food effort alone, uh, donations from the community, private, and um, a little bit of grant and uh, public funding from other groups. Um, we're up over $26,000 in a month's time. So that's fantastic. Gaining Ground reached out to us to provide uh, produce now that uh, the crops are coming in. So that's been a positive just as of this week. Emerson, we're working really closely with them on a number of levels. Some of the thank you efforts are active but there's also a level of administrative connection that um, I've been very active in meeting with the upper level administrators in terms of what their needs may or may not be. And we do a lot of planning and I guess the good news is some of it hasn't been needed um, because they, they've been able to manage in their own environments. So, um, and then we just, you know, try to be sure we're helping with the communication um, to families and the town town's activities and efforts and that that's been a well received set of communication efforts on all levels so there's a lot going on and we're now just getting this week we're starting to spend our time into what the rest of the spring planning needs to be um, and we'll talk a little bit later in the agenda about our um, <laughs> trying to mode out options a b and c as we're awaiting news from the governor governor and what this longevity might be of the of the 
closure. Um, but we're, we're doing a great job of prioritizing and I think getting done what's important and putting on hold what can wait and um, you know, staying on track for the most part given this new world we've entered. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions, comments? Two quite different, Lori, if, if you would. Um, one, we, we reference uh, student wellness. Uh, are we able to change up our attention to employee wellness in such a way that it would be useful in stressful times? Um, I think while I reference student wellness because it's part of the goals from the past, uh, certainly our, we have a major focus on employee wellness and part of the check-ins that we're offering people, whether it be through virtual staff meetings. I've been just sitting in on those because it's a great way to just get a feel for how people are, individual communication, principals and teachers. Um, we've had a couple who have had to say that it's too much and we're appropriately working within the, the guidelines and regulations of what those options are. So I feel like our goal is open communication tell us if you need help, tell us if this is overwhelming, tell us if the family's got things going on. And um, I think that's been well supported. In terms of the other employees that we don't have as ongoing of a connection with, I think the department heads are doing a fantastic job of connecting with their employees, whether it's transportation or cafeteria. So again, I think the goal has been the same, uh, connection, connection. So we all stay close. So thank you for asking. Well, I think this, this school committee uh, wants to regularly uh, what, uh, recognize and affirm the resilience of our, of our staff and faculty. So thank you thank for, you for that. making sure that we're helping them stay strong yeah. on a very, very different kind of topic. Um, is there a great disparity between the student learning on a computer screen and the student learning on a smartphone. Oh. And, is there, and is there anything we can do about it? If, 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 if indeed uh, there's something lost in uh, the, the postage stamp way of learning on a screen, on a telephone. Yeah, I don't, I, you know, I, we're fortunate enough to have laptops for all of our secondary kids. So they mm -hmm. should be on their laptops. Um, elementary, we're working on what those different tools are. And honestly, we've really tried hard to balance so that they're not on technology all the time. So hopefully that offsets good, good. their day and the demand in the house for the screens and hopefully gives them a little bit of wiggle room. Um, I, don't, I can't answer per se if, if, if my inclination is that it would be really hard on the phone, <laughs> but I don't have anything to go with other than anecdotal okay. thoughts on that. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you, Court. Anybody else? I just have a quick question, and I'm sure you've been doing this, but what level of collaboration with the town of Concord uh, leadership and or Carlisle has occurred? Yeah, so th thank you. Yes, I'm uh, regularly in connection with the Concord town leaders. Uh, we are meeting frequently, and sometimes it's a generic check-in, and sometimes it's a specific topic, so I feel very closely connected with them. I've been at a couple of the Carlisle leadership meetings. Um, I know they meet, I think three times a week. So that is probably a little more than my schedule allows, but I work with them on an as needed basis. And I work closely with Jim O'Shea so that I know what their efforts and planning are. And I've certainly been on, e I'm on every email thread too. So I feel, feel very both connected and supported by both communities. And I think that's been a really nice reciprocal relationship. And, certainly one that has to be healthy right now. And I know there was uh, um, some controversy, but it, it looks like all the schools, uh, vehicle access has been shut down. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah. yeah, so we, that was in conjunction with the town. Um, we had closed the school grounds initially, but not really prohibited it actively. Um, and then as the nicer weather came along, I was in several conversations with the town leadership over concerns of groups of people congregating. Um, so we did barrier the driveways. Uh, I, there was one little bit of question just when it first happened. I haven't heard anything since. I think in good news, the town had decided to really 
watch what was going to happen with that and then decide if they were going to need to prohibit it any more than they already had. And I, at this point, they haven't. So at this point, the, the town, some of the town spaces are still available for families or individuals. And um, I think that's the hope is that those can stay, stay that way. But it really depends on the, just as a reminder in this environment, it's going to be based on the public decision making. And, um, you know, if people abide by the recommendations, then it'll stay open. Good question. Thank you to ask me to talk on that. Anybody else? Um. So um, let's move on to uh, new business. And um, I think that I think we've received a report from Jared that has more words than we have ever had in total. <laughs> This is spreadsheets and numbers. I'm impressed. <laughs> so uh, an update on the 2020 budget. So that memo I tried to summarize really what has been the last month. Um, if there's one thing that you can, my takeaway is right now, we just don't know. There's a lot of assumptions until there's a peak, until the governor's budget comes out, we really don't know. So what we've been doing as a, as a business office is we've been in close out mode for the past three weeks. And what that means is we're liquidating as many POs as possible. We are taking remaining available balances in non-essential spending and putting them in a contingency account. So I have, uh, so if a purchase comes in, what we do is we approve it on a case by case basis. And then I uh, make a transfer into that line to get it back into balance. Um, so at this point, at the CPS, at CPS we have a $929,701 unencumbered balance. That does not mean that that is, not go, that is gonna be there till the end of the year. Uh, but what that does mean is we, uh, I'm trying to identify every single dollar that we have in preparation for next year. And I'm even thinking about FY22 and FY23. Um, so that 929 includes any contingencies that we have in our revolving accounts uh, at, the, at the CPS level right now. I don't have anything in Circuit Breaker. Um, our food service accounts right now are being depleted. Um, not to, we had about three months of uh, bills going into this, so we, we'll, we'll be fine, but I'd like to put some of that money back. Um, but what we are doing is we're making sure that I can identify every single dollar, uh, every single purchase order that's out there, and it's fluid, it's a moving target, um, but I've been in contact with all departments, um, and each, each day, each week, it will be getting better. Um, so at the region side, not only we, are we keeping track of the general fund, which has an unencumbered balance of 826,679, but we're also keeping track of our revenue. Uh, and I'm happy to say right now that our revenue is on track for FY20 to come in. Uh, and this is just an estimate at this time. Uh, to be about almost $332,000 more than anticipated. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, number one is because we vote our budget well before the governor budget, uh, governor's budget comes out. So um, uh, our miscellaneous revenue is up uh, due to some laptop payments that, um, not laptop, uh, we sold some, um, some uh, desktops and received more money than anticipated for those. So at the, uh, the high school side, we get to keep the money. And there was a little bit at the K through eight side that goes over to the town, very minimal amount. Um, our E&D, as you know, is about 1.3 million, which is 4%. So we are building up our, our, uh, our E&D, which is essential for this time. Uh, this extra revenue would go into E&D. Uh, if there's any left over, um, that would go back to the two towns. Um, so we are, we are keeping track of the money. 
and we were in, we're and keeping track of what the governor says and, and everything. So we're doing our best to, uh, to predict the unknowns, um, but I think going into this right now, we uh, were in pretty good shape um, until we know we're not, if that makes sense. Can, can we ask questions at this time? Please. Please. Um, okay, thank you, Jared. Um, so. Oh, I'll put my picture on so I'm not looking completely like nobody. Um, on your, I just need some sort of uh, first, a little nomenclature help. So when you report an unencumbered balance, that means that what's left over after you've, if, if all the encumbrances are spent, correct? Correct. And then but on top of that, you say purchase order liquidation. So. In other words, does that mean if, if you had a wreck out there like for tomatoes and you're not going to do it, you close that purchase order out and correct turn that in? Okay. So, and, and also okay. for tuitions. Uh, tuitions, sometimes at the beginning of the year, what we do is we, we encumber what we think is going to be the amount. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, early spring, we look at those and we liquidate. Um, yeah. Sometimes that even happens in June. We're doing a lot of our June work right now. Okay. So with that understanding, and I guess the inbound assumption, let's say for the particular, for this little mini dialogue, let's assume that we are not going back to school by June 30. In other words, there might be a summer program, but there's no, there's no regular ed, in-class regular ed. So does this number, the 827,000 represent what you would save or will it be higher then? Because you're still in the process of liquidating. Right, so I think right now it would be probably a little bit lower, but what this oh. is, is our circuit breaker balances, our food service balances, our, our athletic balances, we need to get them back into good standing, but we also yep. need, especially for circuit breaker and regional transportation, I think those are the two things that are gonna be cut first. Um, so especially for circuit breaker revolving, some of this money, if not all of it, really needs to go back into that. And that can be our contingency going forward. I did not anticipate having much uh, going into FY21. Uh, so I'm not, I was not depending on that money had this not happened. But at this time, uh, I certainly think we will need it. And I also think, and I'm even looking at FY22. I think FY22 is going to be the year that is going to be a little bit of a struggle. And I'm trying to plan even for that. So does that mean, say, for example, you determine that, I'll just pick a number, a quarter million dollars needs to go into a circuit breaker. Does that not count as E&D then? Correct. So the rule, of e &D, the rule of circuit breaker is you're allowed to carry over uh, not a cent more than the allotment that you got the prior year. So we got yeah. about 1.1 million in FY20. Yeah. So I can carry yeah. over at least 1.1 million if, if we choose to. Okay, so it's it's possible that you really have no change in your E&D when you get done with all that. Uh, well, the revenue would go strictly to E&D. You can't take excess revenue and put that okay. back into ah, okay. all the account. So, so, so how how close to the cap of E&D were you inbound at this year? So I'm I'm about four percent. Um, so I'm at about one. One million three hundred and seventy thousand. Right, so you were basically at the cap. Uh, if I get another percent, yes. Right. I mean, you can only go to four, right? You can go to five. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So that leads to the next question, which is, uh, and Melissa, I see Melissa's here. Um, you know, the towns are interested in getting something back, and I presume the easiest math is simply if you exceed the E and D cap then the, clearly that goes back to the town. There's not much discretion. Right. Have you had any dialogue with Concord FinCom on more than that? You want to answer so that? Know, no. Yeah, Wally and Heather just reached out to Dean yesterday. So nothing formal, um, mm -hmm. David. Yeah. So I think, you know, we're, we're of the same mindset, at least Jared and I are, I can't speak for the rest of the committee. Um, given that things we thought we would need funding for, we we don't. Uh, we would right. want to be 
thoughtful about that. I think, as you heard, the first goal is to put our own yeah. safety funds to a healthy yeah. level. So they're right. cash in the bank for other years to come. Right. And then certainly to look at the towns and what we can give back to them. So we want to let it play out a little bit longer, and especially with the decision of whether we're going to open or not. But right. um, to your point, if we assume school closure, I think we will hit the E&D cap and um, have some some to talk on there, so. Okay. All right, thank you. <clears throat> I have a quick question. Yeah, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, did any, uh, did we, uh, um, if you don't mind clarifying, did we, uh, did the school receive all of the funds from the state for this year or were we expecting any additional funds to arrive or are we all set for that as um, the state is going to be looking at their um, at the funds available. Thank you. So fourth quarter revenue, I do not believe is posted or in yet. And I'll just add to that. We've, all, we've both been on a lot of conference calls with both the DESE side and the uh, legislative side. We haven't, despite the challenges happening right now in this quarter um, and the unknowns of what that rebound will be, uh, we are not hearing, right, so far, we are not hearing cuts to FY20. I think partly because we're into April already and much of the year has played out and been funded. Um, all the discussions so far have been about FY21 and for every scenario they play out, they end with, well, we don't know. Um, so there's talk of whether the Student Opportunity Act funding will hold. Um, for us, that's minimal money that we didn't budget for because the, it hadn't even passed when we put our budget together. Um, the governor's budget, what we heard the other day was that they probably are starting from scratch and will try to expedite a process. Jared, you might talk a little bit on the one twelfth process if we don't have budgets by June 30th. Yeah. So tentatively right now, our budget, our town meeting is scheduled for June 22nd. If that gets postponed and we go into July 1st, we would be forced into a one twelfth budget. So what that means, it's, it's essentially a continuation of FY20. It's like a 13th and 14th and 15th month until a, a budget is voted. So we would, we would set up 1 12th of the FY20 budgets. So that's just out there in our um, you know, contingency plans of what, the, what could happen. We're hopeful that it doesn't, but not knowing even what the, I mean, the social distancing alone could push town meetings past June 22nd. It's hard to say. So we're, we're trying to plan for all different scenarios. Um, but FY20, I think even if the state does have to retreat on its fourth quarter aid, um, because of the balances you're looking at today, you can see we're going to be okay. So um, Jared's team's done an amazing job in a very short amount of time to just get a handle on where we are. And now we're into the projection and the what ifs and the, all of that. This week we started to go back through FY21 with all the principles and take a look at that. And um, it's, it's a little early probably to bring anything back to all of you, but that's, that's become part of the work now too, so. Um, I wanna, on that point, Laura, I wanna acknowledge too that I know the Carlisle FinCom did send us some communication and they are looking at FY21 already. And so I just want to acknowledge that, that we, you know, we have seen that and are looking at it, but to your point, we're still at the beginning of looking at FY21 and don't have, you know, answers or projections on that front yet. Right, so I can comment just on having just come off a conversation with the Carlisle FinCom. Great. Just to give some context. So I think, first of all, I'll say Carlisle and Concord very similar, uh, are quite fortunate in that, uh, you know, a, a great majority of our citizens are in jobs that will allow them to work at home and, you know, presumably less affected than a lot of other communities from an economic standpoint. And Carlisle, furthermore, and almost the same for Concord, not completely, is, uh, is it's been a bad thing in many years, is very dependent on property tax, but in this really terrible retail climate, that turns out to be actually a pretty good thing because people are going to pay their property taxes, presumably most people will be able to. So, so that gives them a little bit of a buffer. Um, but both towns obviously are wrestling with, you know, uncertainty. And I agree with Jared, it's mostly fiscal 21 uncertainty. So 
um, naturally being prudent, you know, there's a move to kind of try to rein in any discretionary spending that's happening. Now it's in Con Carlisle schools and Concord schools are doing the same and departments I'm sure are doing exactly the same. Don't, don't spend it if you don't need to. But then the eye towards 21, again, you know, if one makes the assumption that we are back to something close to business as usual at the beginning of the school year next year, you know, the budget pressures don't go away. I mean, it's the same budget pressures we have. So what's unknown is, as Jared points out, what the state will be able to do in the way of chapter 70, circuit breaker and so forth. So, so there's even more pressure, you know, obviously on the district to, as Jared said, to um, have some dry powder, but the towns also want dry powder. So I think that's going to be sort of the, you know, the turf on which the discussion happens. Um, I will say on the Carlisle side, we're trying to look at whether we can leverage savings that we might offer this year to protect what we can of the operating budget for next year, because again, same risk mitigation. We can identify savings now that are real cash savings that we, you know, it comes at a learning cost, but, but in fact, it's something we planned on spending that we didn't spend, but we have no idea what we're going to need to spend in the following year. So anyway, I would just take that as a, as a piece of, uh, you know, not advice really, but just a kind of a, a point to have a strategic discussion about because at the end of the day, you know, the money's the money. It doesn't really matter which fiscal year it comes out of if the end goal is just to have enough reserve. The right. mechanisms to adjust across the years. So I think from, you know, again, from the Carlos standpoint, if we can save some money this year and give the town a little bit of it or some of it, then that's a hedge against next year. We also need our own hedge in the form of whatever contingencies are built into, you know, the operating budget. Uh, David, uh, apropos of that, um, and to Jared, could you speak a little bit to the plan or the thinking behind uh, the technology investments for fourth quarter going ahead as originally planned? Um, was there consideration to the fact that we might have shifting tech needs given the fact that uh, we've changed dramatically what they are for fiscal 20 and 21 has some new unknowns? I think that was somewhere between one hundred thousand and two hundred thousand dollars. Uh, Laura, do you want to speak about some of the new things that we'll need, and I'll talk about the financial aspect? Yeah, I guess we want to start with the with the rotation plan that we've worked really hard to build. Because when I walked in three years ago, um, the re the replacement plan for the technology had fallen off. Um, it had become the safety net in the budget and it wasn't being spent on technology often because other things had come up as a priority. So we worked really hard, Jared, Peter Kelly and I, to get a sustainable plan to make sure that the technology doesn't fall behind again. Um, and so I feel, and especially now in this environment, um, feel very committed that that money needs to help to maintain a fleet of current uh, modern devices so we don't get to a point and I've lived this in other districts if you let it lag and then it accumulates instead of some of the numbers we look at now you can be into the millions and trying to upgrade everything at once and um, we've built we've built a line item that now can be sustained and not need to increase but it'll maintain the the health and wellness of our, our their devices so I think that's my mindset there and in this environment it feels more important than it might have even six weeks ago, Court, to your question. Well, yeah, I, I agree with you about the importance, uh, which in fact has, has in fact been heightened greatly for, mm -hmm. for everybody involved. Uh, however, the decisions that we made uh, 12 months ago, uh, have they changed in terms of how tech needs have changed regarding the fact that uh, we're doing so much remote learning and remote teaching right now. That's all I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not yeah. questioning the investment. Oh, sure. I, I'm fully on board with, with the need there, but uh, the, the specifics around where the money, where the resource is being directed uh, 
Uh, I can't speak to where it should be directed. I'm just asking, was it uh, thought through yet again uh, because uh, there might indeed be changing needs right now? I actually think this whole experience has shown us that the decisions and plans that were executed over the last couple of years to upgrade some infrastructure and maintain, get the five-year cycle back, I think it's been very validating. We have been almost totally seamless in all of this Good. in a way that really has tested all of that. So I think we all feel really good about those decisions. If this had happened three years ago where some of the infrastructure had started to age and some of the devices, I think it would have been a lot more, mm -hmm. a lot more challenging than it's been. So good. thank well, you to the support of everybody. That's heartening to know that it's been uh, rigorously tested one more time before we go out the door with purchases this mm -hmm. quarter. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I just will add on that, that, you know, I think what, whatever happens, however the uh, world comes back, it will be, everybody acknowledges the world will be different. And I think work life, home life, school life, the dependence on technology the trend that was happening anyway is just going to be accelerated. So, you know, it's definitely not the time to cut back on technology, infrastructure, and resource. And I think that is also one of the questions that was posed by the Carlisle Fincom is, you know, what does learning look like? You know, is it is there more? Let's say just for whatever bunch of reasons, there's more dependence on, you know, online tools. What does that do to your budget? So, I mean, there they're certainly open to understanding that the mix of expenses might change. And on that topic, one more thing I would add is um, there'll be an overhang, and I forget the term, I think it's called additional services, but uh, Lori would know much better, but there, there's gonna be an overhang of additional SPED expenses, I think, that are gonna be needed when kids do come back because of the shortfall in the service delivery model presently, which doesn't lend itself as well to online. And if it is online, it's one-to-one. -one. Maybe, Laura, you can comment on that. Sure. So um, I know you're referencing compensatory services. Maybe. We yeah. are strategizing that already. That's when a student isn't receiving what um, they should be in their IEP, and we have to backtrack and owe them, owe them time. Um, this is a really interesting environment that's just completely uncharted. Uh, so we're we're gonna have we're gonna take this one student at a time and see how all of this goes. Um, we are actively preparing for those contingencies for whatever kids. Um, I expect it's a smaller number than the aggregate number of special education kids, but um, to what those different ways of providing those services could look like, and that certainly would include um, some options for the summer that we are looking at potentially expanding. And then even strategizing the variants of what those could look like if we can't do them in person, what technology can we continue to use or enhance throughout the summer to make sure kids are still receiving whatever they um, need so that regression doesn't happen. So all of those layers are part of our thought process, um, knowing that we don't know how this will, will result. Um, there's a really interesting dynamic that's never happened before where the entire aggregate is being dramatically infected by the lack of full instruction in a classroom. So how that plays into special, and I'm, I'm gonna pull individual kids out of this discussion for a minute and just talk high level law. What, what does that mean with special education law um, when everyone essentially is going to regress at a different way than we, have any idea how to measure until it's over. So there's some really interesting, I sound like I'm intrigued by it. I'm pretty much up at night worrying about it, but uh, the, the, the layers are all on our radar. So but as it, I mean, to, to fold it back into the present discussion, I, I'm, a, I'm discussing it more in financial than pedagogical mm -hmm. terms, right? One needs to reserve, however it's, you know, adjudicated is one thing, but it's clear that kids will have, sped kids will have suffered from not having the personal contact that is maybe even more important for them. And therefore there'll be an overhang of need of things to do and that costs money. Right? Yeah, that's likely right. Yeah. That's, you know, just kind of in a very high level, mm -hmm. uh, maybe sanitized version, you know, we just need to reserve some more money sure. to do all that whenever we do come back. Sure. 
to that point, can I ask one more one question? Um, so for the special education students, are we, um, since, um, you know, the, the regression, regression levels are um, going to be substantial in some cases, are, are we uh, putting money aside right now for um, training, opting up, um, going up a little bit more on training of the teachers to um, be prepared for those needs when they arrive back in school? So we're looking at different various levels right now. The first one and the one we spent the most time on right now is actually their emotional well-being and knowing that um, some of the kids with anxiety special education needs are really struggling right now um, and as well as the aggregate group of kids. So that's been the first focus is in terms of and then we've been using the word trauma because it feels appropriate. Uh, trauma kinds of training for teachers and knowing that as we come out of this, there's gonna be residuals, um, certainly very deeper ones potentially for some of our special education students. So that's our first round. We're uh, working with Ruth and Kristen both on the academic side, um, very specifically on reading and language-based needs. Those are often the ones that um, show themselves first is that if a child hasn't continued to receive services, although we are providing them, they're different in the way they're being delivered, um, being sure that we're, we're ready to support them and um, can work with teachers to still provide content to kids, even if, um, and I, I guess the part I'll say, there's a lot of learning going on while they're in these environments. So our teachers are really working hard to be sure all kids can access curriculum and they're using modifications and accommodations that maybe they weren't using before, but the technology is allowing the kids a way to access the material. So we want to be sure all that continues as we go into a more typical environment um, whenever that happens. So you're right, it needs to be training and we need to probably make that big list of what those needs are and also benefit from the skills we've developed in this uh, whole new way of doing things. So it's all of that. And I understand you, you, you uh, through your Q&A sessions uh, with Ruth and the uh, special education parents and the um, board um, and the liaisons from uh, CPAC, you're getting that feedback currently, correct, from the parents to sort of figure out what those needs and plan for them? We Is are, and that's, that's a great point. We really need individual feedback sometimes because um, we want to be sure that if a child isn't really benefiting or settling in or you know really accessing the services they're being provided that does sometimes require an individual level but at the cpac level of feedback they've been collecting questions and then bringing them to us ruth then liaisons back in her regular meetings with the special educators so that loop feels like it's working pretty well um, the one point i'll just keep saying is if there's an individual need the best place to bring that is to the case managers and the administrators so that we're sure to tweak whatever isn't working. And that doesn't always happen if it comes to us through a CPAC environment or a more general environment. Also to Court's point earlier about capturing what's going on throughout all of this, um, hopefully we can capture the good that is happening. You mentioned things that, you know, accommodations that couldn't even be made before that are now. And it'd be great to hear at some point about some of those silver linings that are coming out of this and, and the things that are being done during this whole thing. So Kristen and Ruth both are capturing, um, I think they're calling it best practices or something a little more fun than that, but because uh, we are spotting some really amazing things that are happening as teachers provide really creative ways to do things. Um, and we want to be sure we're able to, to you know, do that step back after all this. And so, you know, that would be fantastic to roll into the traditional classroom too. That's yeah. great. Any other questions about the, about the budget update? Let's move on to uh, plans for possible extended closure. Yeah, and I'll just hit the high levels of all the variations of this that are on our radar right now. Um, the first is the spring, obviously. If there is a return to school, we're already strategizing cleaning and some of the other pieces of that. We're hearing some really interesting thoughts on what school could look like if we go back or even when we go back, regardless of the time frame of kids splitting days or um, not a big group of kids in the cafeteria. Some really interesting thought-provoking 
things that we're already starting to deliberate a bit on. Um, that said, we are feeling fairly, there's a bit of an assumption that we aren't going back this spring. So we're also really actively looking at what the summer and fall look like. So I mentioned Kristen's work with the curriculum. We've just referenced some of the special education work. Um, emotional and social needs, we know that's going to be a priority and that reentry has to address all of that um, all the way out to, you know, ensuring that closure for this year, if it doesn't happen in the spring, what does that look like going into the fall where kids just essentially left with no notice and are there some transition work we need to do there? Um, so we're making those lists in a pretty deep fashion and for every topic there's a plan a b and c so having some known deadlines and plans will from the state level will be very very beneficial um, i was also really pleased and um, happy to hear when we met with the commissioner earlier this week the state is working on some of these same contingencies and we'll be putting out guidance on all of the different levels of things which i think sounds very very helpful um, including things like power standards so that we all have a direction to go when we're looking at how to approach curriculum as we return. We aren't trying to cram everything into less amount of time, but we're, we're getting help with the prioritization of that. So um, there's a lot of active work going on. I think the part I'd most immediate is the summer programming and making sure we've got options there. Uh, we're still certainly gonna build the model we had planned, but we're also looking to see how we might tweak it so more kids might be able to participate. And we're building a second tier of remote and online. And boy, I'm a little fascinated that if we can have regular summer school, could we still do some of the remote and online? Heather, to your point of don't throw the baby in the bathwater um, as things get a little more normal. So that's our biggest priority this next two weeks is to figure out what that plan looks like with its variations while we build the big picture. And then just the basics, need to get tweaked. We're reworking kindergarten registration because that set of families didn't get to come and do that with us. And that's very important information on both sides. Um, we're work, reworking our um, hiring, which I've put all the administrators on a hiring freeze, although I've said they can start interviewing because we don't have a budget. So, but I also don't want to miss the season. So we're trying to tweak our processes there. Um, there's some really basic things we're reinventing in this environment, especially as we prepare for another school year. This is May and June is really focused on the coming year and trying to be sure all those pieces are in place. Um, Ruth is planning transition meetings from school to school, just like she would have in person for special education students. So it's, I feel like it's coming. The master plan will have all this laid out and all of the contingencies built and we're what the, go the goal is right now to build the structure so we can also do it in a collaborative fashion um, with the staff and as appropriate with parents and make sure we're trying to not miss any of the major pieces. But I think we're bracing that normal won't be normal and trying to predict what some of those pieces will be and be ready for the ones we can't. So I do Lori. think, oh yeah, go ahead. So. Sir, well, I, wait till you're, are you, fin you not finished? Yeah, I'm finished. Go ahead. Sure. So on the question, because we also had this discussion with Carlisle, mm -hmm. if, if, assuming there's no school, you know, through the regular school year, but that if we're allowed to resume some version of gathering in the summer, then it sounds like you're planning a more robust summer program that would include regular ed and special ed students. Yes, our um, K-5 program has always included regular ed, uh, so yes, okay. definitely. And if we're not encouraged, if we're encouraged to retain social distancing or there's a command even to not resume that sort of thing, you're considering an online model, mm -hmm. uh, which is a continuation of now, which is okay. But there's another option, I suppose, which would be let's say hypothetically, since we're looking at hypotheticals, that it's not clear that you can go back J July 1, but say it's pretty clear you can go back on August 1. Mm -hmm. Just simply move the start time of the school year and get a, more of a school year, or maybe some breaks farther down in the school year, but get started early, something like that. 
Well, I think that would be a proposal we'd have to bring to all of you and to the bargaining units. Our contracts are very clear about the earliest possible start dates. Um, it would essentially be reworking the whole calendar and I expect you'd want, we'd want to gather community input on that as well. Um, if we were trying to make changes to that grand of a scale, I think I'll answer two on the summer side of things. If July isn't an option for a more, you know, in-person setting for summer programming, might we shift it a little bit if we were going to yeah. benefit from that? I think we probably would, especially if we could predict it enough to, to maximize yeah. it. So thank you. Those David, are great I, questions. Yeah, great questions. David, I think you're getting at something that we should think about, even though it's way too big for us. And that is the idea that uh, a reopening of the world could be uh, something that is done in fits and starts with open up, partial close down. I mean, this is what the uh, the science tells us is right. it's not going to be uh, a a straight line uh, yeah. reopen. And so, if there was some anticipation of flexibility, it might mirror what people are going to tell us is going to be required. Yeah, I mean, there's the, you know, who knows how it goes. There's the thing that says you can open, but you have to practice social distancing, like six foot social distancing. So guess what? Half of you come in, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and the other half come in Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And we yeah. got, that's more of a teaching load, but it's fewer kids or who knows what. I mean, it could be any of those things. And I agree that I think we're, we're a smart enough district and a well, you know, provisioned enough district that we ought to be leading on mm -hmm. starting to frame out the what ifs. Yeah. Totally agreed. Good. Anything else? Just my last comment will be, I think we'll know fairly soon from the governor what his next decision is. So hopefully I think that'll help everybody. The unknown is, is the hardest part. So a little bit more information will be very helpful. Can he make some kind of commitment to early next week? That is what we're hearing. I haven't heard it from the governor, but I've heard yeah. it from a lot of other places. So yeah. I mean, obviously May 4th isn't going to be that far away once we're into next week. So. Exactly. All yeah. right. <laughs> we'll hope. I think you're yeah. Okay. okay. Next one. On to the next one. So superintendent evaluation. Um, I'll just take this and I don't know if we'll need much time on it. You all tasked Eva and I with um, kind of leading and organizing the process for our superintendent evaluation. She and I talked recently and we just wanted to bring this question to the group here, um, including all of the school committee members and Dr. Hunter, of course, um, on how we want to look at this. Uh, I think I will also preface the conversation with the fact that like Lori said, since we don't know for sure what's going to happen as of May 4th, um, I don't know that we're not necessarily asking for a firm decision on anything today, um, uh, unless we get to something like that. But I think we both kind of agreed that we have to look at the reality right now, which is that uh, there's a good chance that we're not coming back to school this year, despite the fact that we don't know for sure. Um, we also have to look at what's going to happen um, in terms of teacher evaluations through the schools, which we've all just discussed a little bit, Zach. Uh, and we need to at least start to pencil out a, a thought process for how we look at the superintendent evaluation for this year. Um, one potential suggestion, you know, there are very op various options, obviously. One is to just decide not to do it for the year and wait until next year. Uh, we could postpone it for some tentative date. We could postpone it indefinitely. Um, and just kind of wanted to start to get some comfort level and feelings out there. Um, I'll, I'll wait and not weigh in until maybe we let some other people weigh in. Eva, do you want to add anything else first? Uh, yeah, so the... Um uh, the evaluation also carries a, a big load of, of work that needs to be pre prepared. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it can be a, a fair evaluation of all the um, efforts that have been done um, uh, throughout the uh, year. So the question to the committee also will be, do we, um, you know, how much time do we have to devote to that right now? 
if it makes sense to do this now or um, would would it be um, the superintendent and the committee be uh, and the public be uh, better served if we if we wait um, you're right I, I should have mentioned that and to add to that it's it's really not just about how much time we should be putting it into it but also how much time we're asking Lori right. to put into that given everything else um, and That's the right. priorities that we're asking her to focus on right now so thank you um, yes we should put it within that context <laughs> So I'll offer up that I uh, think that it would be wise to move ahead with this. I have seen something from the state, if I'm correct, that said one of the options would be to uh, conduct an evaluation that uh, was through March and then just do a full stop there for evaluation purposes. Um, I think we're a, a, a teaching and learning organization and we uh, preach the virtues of uh, feedback all the time. Uh, I think Lori's been uh, extraordinarily communicative in many, many uh, ways that uh, are very useful to us such that I don't think that the, the information necessary for the evaluation process would be a, a big lift. I don't think it should be or would be. Uh, if I'm correct, our process has, has often been uh, some version of setting uh, uh, setting the process up uh, as a collective conversation, then individually looking at uh, metrics and individually meeting with the superintendent, then individually sending uh, sending information to uh, the school committee designees who collect it and aggregate it. Uh, if I'm correct, that being our process, uh, I think it's important we go ahead and, and, and do it and recognize that uh, it's, it's a nine month uh, uh, window that we're looking at and uh, do it well and uh, close that chapter and move on would be my thinking at this point in time. Others are, I, I can weigh in further or Wally, Cynthia, do you want to, or David, do you want to jump in before I do? Um, I can just tell you what I've been. Um, I, I think it would be unfortunate if we didn't have in the record uh, going forward evaluation for this year. Um, given the importance of what we're working on daily to um, meet the needs of kids and faculty. I would like, if we're, if we're going to do this, I think we ought to do it uh, with deference to the superintendent um, as far as, you know, what time she can give to it and when she can give it, whether now is the right time to do this or is it better to do it certainly on the other side of 5-4 if we're still in school and we get through whatever that entails as far as adjustments um, and then you know we're going to be close on the heels of that working on how do we handle <clears throat> bringing kids back and <clears throat> filling in the obvious gaps that are taking place in this process in their in their learning. Um, so I just I really, as far as workload for the superintendent relative to this evaluation, I, I want to be uh, careful as to what we ask of her that, you know, it's, it's something that is readily available, isn't going to take a ton of time. Um, you know, even meeting individually with seven of us on a phone call is over a day's work. Um, so uh, I just want to throw that in as a caveat, recognizing what I said at the outset, which is, you know, over time, I think, it, you know, you look back and it's it would be unfortunate if there was a gap in evaluations. Um, so it's my two cents. So Wally and, and what, a lot of what, what Court said that, um, 
just to have a, a nothing um, says, I don't think it's a, a good statement, you know, on either side, but I, I totally agree about we need to be mindful of the time commitment on the superintendent side, but I think we can figure out a way to streamline that so it's not an hour on the phone, but it's something much, much uh, shorter. Um, I'm a question to Heather and Eva. Is there a good way to sort of streamline the process or is it so uh, prescribed that we cannot? Well, uh, no, I wouldn't say it's so prescribed that we cannot. Uh, in terms of a good way, I'm not sure. Um, that was going to be my comment, actually, is that it's one thing to say, let's do it without demanding it take too much time. It's another thing to really implement that. Um, I'm not sure exactly what it looks like with less of a time commitment. It usually is a pretty big time commitment. Um, time commitment by the administration. I would say on both parts, the administration as well as um, the school committee to varying degrees for the for the couple of people who are running it um, or, or organizing the process and taking the all of the feedback uh, and aggregating it into one review that's a big time commitment um, now that can certainly be done but i think it's also a big time commitment on the part of the administration so um, i've been you know historically i've been quite adversarial to the desi process i haven't done it for the region so you guys haven't experienced my you know gentle management style on that. But um, generally speaking, in Carlisle, we've kind of ignored the instruction and just done it the way we want, which is a more holistic view of the performance of the superintendent. And it's been fine, you know, and it's a good interchange for um, meaningful dialogue on both sides in terms of, you know, what's working, what's not, where should improvements be without getting tied up in the details. And, and the reason for that at least I won't go too long on this, but historically we had a superintendent a while back who was just a complete stickler for you know detail and it was so lost in detail, it was kind of meaningless. Um, and so we certainly took the opportunity with the new superintendent when we had him to you know, take a fresh look. Um, so that's one thing. But secondly, maybe more importantly, in my mind, you wouldn't hire and you wouldn't retain a superintendent if that per if you weren't confident that person was going to be able to do the blocking and tackling so endlessly reviewing blocking and tackling is not to me a productive use of the board's time um, what's more important i think is placing that those accomplishments into the overall canvas of where's the district going what challenges has it met and what challenges is it preparing to meet for the future and in the case we have right now that is absolutely the situation, right? I mean, the, the, you know, not to give away the punchline, but Lori's response and the administration's response to this challenge has, we would all agree has been phenomenal. And so why are we worried about whether she had six meetings or eight meetings? Who cares? You know, I mean, the point is a challenge was laid out, it was met, and now we have a whole new set of things that we just finished discussing 10 minutes ago about a world we don't even know what it looks like. And that's really where we're valuable as a board. So I have to ask, if you don't follow the rules, so what? Are the DESE police gonna cuff us off? They're not. We ought to be focused on what's important and let's design it so it works for both of us. And it doesn't have to be, it may still be several hours, but those will be useful hours. That'll be meaningful feedback and preparatory for you know the next phase. That's what I would say. So I like all those points, David. That makes a lot of sense to me to focus on what's important in the big picture. Um, I think in the past few years, at least of myself doing this and a few others, I think we've tried to take that out of the DESI or get that out of the DESI process and, mm -hmm. and take the superintendent's goals that we've talked about and lay them over that DESI process so that we are talking about what's important to us. Um, but I like the suggestion that I don't know, maybe we don't have to use their prescribed process if we, if that means we can do it in a way that's more simple and efficient. Um, Lori, I'd love your take on all of this in terms of um, both what's realistic for you, because I think we would all also agree that the priority right now is students and all of the teaching and learning changes that are happening. 
Um, and also uh, kind of your thoughts on how we make sure that we focus on the goals that we've talked about and the things that you've updated us on all year uh, versus that DESE process and which is more important and how they overlap. Yeah, I had a couple of thoughts, which doesn't necessarily exactly give you what I'm sure I want, but I was thinking in terms of timing. I think it's probably a decision we should wait to see what the governor says. I think my world, if he closes school for the rest of the year, we will get over a hump the first two weeks in May to settle into that. And I think it's, it's one, one path. If he goes a middle ground, which I frankly have a little concern he might, um, where there's still some hope of going back, that, that's a lot of transition still and a lot of unknown. So I, I, it might change my opinion on where the best time is. So I think a little more information on real timelines might be helpful. And since it's so imminent, uh, maybe not settling on that today makes sense. I think to some of all of what you've said, there's definitely value in going back and looking at the goals and the work we did up until May 12th. I feel like I'm like two different people right now, you know, so it would be very healthy to remind us all of that work. And under the umbrella of this, sure, but also just to remind us. But then I think to David's point, put that set of goals that got left, you know, just abruptly got left where it was in this unknown new world. And I think that starts to really breed a productive idea of what we're going to do going forward. Certainly it'll help me have a nice round of feedback from all of you in terms of how, how all those overlay each other. Um, so I think it's a combination of those two. I don't know what the best timing is. I think once we definitively know more of the spring, then I can answer that better. And I do think there's value. I think the the only, you know, I think you've already spoken on my behalf that to say I have hours to sit and pull evidence and all of that, you know, I just really don't. So I'm not even going to say that out loud. And let's make it a collaborative, healthy, useful process. I think that part makes good sense. So just so I, I think what I'm hearing, um, I just want to make a proposal is that we should table us at the very in, to talk about it at the next meeting, which I assume is going to be like two weeks or so, but mm -hmm. we'll set that later in the meeting. And that Heather and Eva, maybe you could think a little bit about if we were to go forward with some type of evaluation, how we might be able to further streamline it and, and make it a less um, time consuming project, at least for the superintendent. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, so Evan, and I. Yes, and the, the question also, uh, uh, I have a quick question. Would we adjust the goal? I mean, we have a set of goals and standards for, uh, for this year evaluation. Would we adjust, should we be thinking of adjusting the goals a little bit as um, the, you know, so make it more valuable uh, information for planning ahead? How we look at the evaluation? Well, again, uh, this goes I into the jump in there. we should uh, have in the next meeting. But I think that it's obvious that we didn't get to the end of our year. So of course we have to make some adjustments. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we did even with even without what happened, we we got derailed on some things um, during the course of the year. And um, I th to me the the evaluation is based on on this year, what we've done to date and um, the analysis probably needs to be adjusted for the reality of what we experienced. Right. Um, we go through a pretty, you know, I don't, I don't want it to be lost on us that we go through a fairly uh, lengthy process to create the goals in the fall. And, you know, they're, they're based on things that we, that we want to have happen. Um, and we've got a pretty complex set up here that the superintendent has to navigate between two districts and one of them being a region. Um, I understand where David's coming from, but I think we're, I think this is a little too complex to just want to talk about some things at the beginning of the year that we'd like to do and then kind of monitor them. The way we go about this gives us a chance to really think about what we're trying to do 
over the next year, which we would undertake in the late summer and early fall. Um, and then a way to, to sort of assess what's going on through the course of the year. And that the exercise we're talking about right now is reflective. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously there's probably a level of reflection that needs to be done by uh, Eva and Heather uh, with a little bit of input from the superintendent about, you know, based on the goals that we would be using, you know, what should be, you know, what needs to be blacked out um, and what needs to be adjusted before we even start to ask about evidence and and creation of, you know, what we're gonna use as individual members. Um, I, I, having used this format for three years, I guess, um, and had the opportunity to use the previous one, uh, I think this is pretty good. Um, and, uh, you know, having seven people try to have a conversation about in a sort of a freeform conversation might be pretty challenging uh, over a K-12 district that's part, part one, this part one town and part two towns. So. Well, let me just jump in. I, I don't mean to, I don't leave the impression that I wanted to ignore the goals. I definitely don't want to ignore the goals. I, I more, you know, I'm more hung up on the need to amass evidence to prove the goals. And I think, so I, I do believe there's a happy medium and maybe Heather and Eva can kind of hammer, think through that. I think the goals, to your point, Molly, we put a lot of thought into the goals and we have good goals and we shouldn't, we should review the goals and the progress that was made to the point of, you know, the world changing. And I think that that's all valid. And then how much of the goals that are left undone need to be rolled into the following year for various reasons not as a penalty, but just, hey, you know, this is still important and you got to pick it back up. So I think, and I don't mean to imply that we would have a free form dialogue or, you know, multi-part, we wouldn't have a, just a free form meeting about like the world. I think it should have a structure. It's just that as other people pointed out, the structure should be streamlined so that we stay really focused at a high level and we don't unduly burden either side to have to sift through mountains of evidence to buttress the point. We're all smart enough. We've worked together long enough to know what we've done and what we haven't done. And mm -hmm. Lori's one of the most honest people I've ever met. She's not going to say she didn't do something if she didn't do it. So, you know, we just take that on. So I, I think there's ways to chop big pieces of it out and maybe A, make it shorter and easier in this time and B, you know, maybe give a little bit of, room to a sort of more of a blue sky thing because that's a useful as Lori said it's kind of a capstone on this process given where we are and and that's all got it thank you yeah. okay good so we'll take it away Eva and I will coordinate and work with Lori and come back with um, either a suggestion or some options or something for our next meeting okay uh, mr. chairman I, yeah. I apologize I have another meeting um, I'm happy to vote, you know, anything that's on the agenda that requires a vote, I support. And I also support more frequent meetings, but I, I have to uh, leave. Great. Uh, well, I'll, uh, I'll let you know what we decide on meetings. And Okay. Uh, thank you very much, all. Okay, Stay thank safe. you. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you. I, well, we still I'm have here. Tomorrow, so we're, we're okay. And Wally and Heather to the chairs. I've got a hard stop at 3.30, please. Absolutely. I think we can, we should be able to do that easily. Yeah. Um, so school committee meeting schedule, we were toying in with uh, once every two weeks going forward here um, and recognizing that, um, you know, we have been asked by the community to, uh, sort of keep meetings limited to things that are emer sort of a immediate executive nature. Um, I don't see us adhering to that when we're going to have a meeting every two weeks. Um, but uh, I think we can certainly try to do that. I don't, I mean, we haven't had a meeting in a while, so this is 
and kind of long. I don't think our next meeting would be quite as long um, and be pretty focused on a couple of things we've identified today. But um, the uh, I guess the question is we, we didn't do this on Thursday for any reason other than the decision to do it came along a little late to try to do it on Tuesday. Um, so I'd throw out that we do this on on Tuesdays, which is our normal day, and uh, pick a time that works for everybody. Sounds good. And mm -hmm. many other communities are meeting fairly frequently, I would say, just because I wouldn't say there are emergency things that come up, but there are decisions that need to be or supported. Yeah, where does yeah more decisions have to be made? Um, yeah, I, I think you know I think we're okay there. Um, so then the next one, if we look two weeks out from this week, at least, would be April 28th. Mm -hmm. um, Is this time good for people? So if we're voting, I would vote for mornings versus afternoons. But what does everybody else think? <laughs> I have a Tuesday standing work meeting at 1 on Tuesdays. OK. Uh, yeah. no. I don't do much else at work right now, so that I shouldn't probably miss. <laughs> I'm I'm flexible on the 28th. I can do the morning. Sure. I'm I'm flexible on the 28th. Although um, there's five people on Wi-Fi <laughs> doing uh, I know. The their morning, Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's a little trickier in Carlisle, <laughs> but okay. I can do any time that fits the committee. Okay. Um, should we pencil in nine o'clock? Sure. That'd be good. Okay. Nine and expect to be done by 10 30. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Okay. And uh, let's just plan, you know, so, so you can get your vacation schedule lined up. Right. Uh, and you're out of house meetings. <laughs> Every Tuesday, every second Tuesday from here to uh, you know, at least into June um, at, at nine o'clock on Tuesday. Yep, sounds good. Okay, so uh, what do we have here? Vote to accept gift donation from Concord Ed Fund to fund the video conferencing subscription, which we're using right now. Actually, we're using the towns right now. <laughs> right. Well, we'll Lori, is that just CCHS or is that both districts? That is just the region, yeah. Just the region, right? Okay. They funded, the biggest need was at the high school and they funded the entire ask. So we're really okay. grateful for the support. And I also want to really give them a shout out because they initiated the contact and said, what do you need, Lori? And it timed itself right with the, with the bill. So it's just really well support. You know, we're being well supported and grateful for that. Is is that a year long subscription? It is. Yes, it is. So we're. I I don't think we're gonna. I think we're gonna be used to this. Is what I think. <laughs> so, nice. <laughs> all right. I just hope we have those elections. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you guys get your work cut up for you. Yeah. Well, you don't love us enough to stick around a while. Well, I'm gonna listen. They put a. I'm back. I'm sorry. They moved my meeting. Oh. Have they set a caucus date? Oh, you guys had your caucus. That's right. Correct. No, we, yeah, we had that caucus. Yeah. We've got a date. It's in, uh, in May sometime. Mm -hmm. um, 11th, I think. June 11th. Get June. your absentee ballots up. Just hope we have a meeting. Um, the, uh, so can I, do we want to include the dollar amount? In? There's no language for this. Yeah, so. we don't have. There is it. language attached to the agenda. There is? It's there not. Is. So I'll make a motion that the Conquer Carlisle School Committee vote to accept the donation of $11,930 from the Concord Ed Fund. Second. Anybody? Second. Um, all in favor? Uh, do it by roll call. Uh, I think, think Warren will echo the superintendent's gratitude to the Ed Fund. Definitely. Um, and we need to go by roll call, Wally. What? We need to vote everything by roll call. Oh, yes. because we're on a video? Because we're on a video. So, about aye. Booth aye. Rainy aye. Modell aye with gratitude. 
Mustafi, I would great thank you. Uh, John Stenheim, and thank you to the CEF. Um, so the next would be uh, to, do we need this today? Are we doing, this weekend? that is completely up to you given the way our conversation ended. So if you'd like to wait two weeks, we're fine. Um, can I just get a head nod about whether we ought to proceed with voting on this today? Um, if you think we should, just nod your head yes. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Cynthia? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, vote, David. Yes. I don't care. <laughs> okay. I defer to the will of the majority. Is there, I, I am clearly working it's on the agenda. It's not current. Is there language for this on the, uh, on the agenda? On the web, yeah, on the attachment there is on the web page. Cynthia, can you read that for us? Or make that motion? Mute. The Conquer Carlisle, I move that the Conquer Carlisle School Committee votes to approve the memorandum of agreement with the CCTA regarding, are we on CTA or CCTA? C CCTA. Thank you. CTA. Which one? CCTA. CCTA regarding the 2019-2020 teacher evaluation process. Second. Second, okay. So uh, any discussion? Let's, uh, Go by roll. Out aye. Booth aye. Rainy aye. Mustafi aye. Odell aye. Johnston aye. Ayes have it. Um, and Heather, you want to take the next one? Um, sure, yes. Is, is there a motion? Uh, Cynthia, do you want to read it for the CTA? Do you have it in front of you still? I do. I do. I move that the Concord School Committee votes to approve the memorandum of agreement with the CTA regarding the 2019-2020 teacher evaluation process. Is there a second? Second. Okay. okay. Any further discussion on this one? <laughs> then I take a vote by roll call. Jones tonight. Booth aye. Rainy aye. And bout aye. Okay. They're both passed. So any parting words before we? Um, sorry, just one quickly. There was a question um, that came into me at least to mention the middle school project on the Concord front. Sorry, this is Concord, but I'll be very quick. Only that um, we have had one Zoom call, uh, public meeting by Zoom, uh, even though it's not necessarily considered emergency per se, it was to keep our uh, contracted designer and OPM moving on what they needed to move on. Um, so that has happened and they are out doing some work for us and we will be having our next public meeting uh, next Thursday morning. I don't know my calendar to see. Mm -hmm. 23rd. The 20, 23rd, 23rd, exactly, at 7.30 a.m. by Zoom. So that will be posted with a link to it. Um, so just wanted to do that quick update that that's where we are on the middle school project. And it is moving to some extent just to keep our uh, hired our contracted firms moving along. Um, I want to thank all of you for uh, being engaged in this process. It's been a real challenge for us. Um, and I most assuredly want to thank Superintendent and Director of Finance for the work they've put in to get us to where we are. And uh, a shout out to all the faculty and the rest of the administration. This is uh, exceptional times. and. Uh, I think everybody is performing admirably. Um, Thank you. So I think, I think we, can, we can extend that to the students and families who are yes. adapting magnificently. All those new at-home teachers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. <laughs> Glad <them> <laughs> you know, much appreciation to them all. Thank you. Um, take a motion to adjourn. So move for both. Seconded for both. Perfect. Aye. Oh, got to do a roll. Question before we move yeah. to adjourn. Where, where, when's our next meeting? Where did you oh, guys? Oh, uh, it's a, it's a... April 28th, Monday, Tuesday morning. April 28th. Yep. Yep. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, Odell, I. Booth, I for both. Rainy, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Thank you.
pounds to nine for both. All right. Oh, the dogs in favor too. Yeah. <laughs> Did the dog vote? He's continuing to vote. That's I. <laughs> Probably will after the meeting's adjourned. <laughs> Stay safe, everyone. Have yeah, a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe.